This is CBC Here and Now. No layoffs, no problem. Just start from scratch next time round. That is not on for us. We cannot go there. Um, I just feel this is a place I need to be. Remembering the lives lost on Flight 491. He shoots and he scores! Newfoundland and Labrador's Liam Hickey puts another one in the back of the net. Our latest snowmaker departs as we roll over the next 12 hours. Bit of a break and then we're watching our next system which is brewing off to the south. The details are coming up. Nine years ago today, 17 people lost their lives traveling to work in the offshore. Two pilots and 15 passengers died. Only one person survived the crash of Cougar Flight 491. Families of the victims are remembering their loved ones today, and tonight they'll come together for the annual service at St. Mary's Anglican Church in St. John's. That's where here now's Carolyn Stokes is standing by live. Carolyn. Well, Anthony, as you can see, people are just starting to arrive at this service tonight. Hundreds of people usually attend this annual service. And at the center of it all, these 17 faces, 17 lives lost, 17 families who still miss them every day. I'm told that we will not be hearing the words victim or tragedy here tonight. The service is not about that. It's about celebrating the lives of these people and supporting the families who still mourn them every day. Oh my goodness. Oh, finally. A shared hug and a shared bond. This is the first time Lori Chin and Maxine Lear have met, but both are visiting this place to remember John Pelly. For Lear, he was a friend and colleague. For Chin, he was a beloved husband. You learn to cope. Um, you know, we're all resilient in our own way. But, uh, you know, there are things that brings it back, like today or if you hear something on the news. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a daily struggle for sure. He was always good to me and uh, he was fun. And uh, when we get on the chopper together, I used to think, I'm sitting by Pelly because if anything happens, he'll save me. <laughs> On this day every year, this fence outside the Cougar building becomes a makeshift memorial. I'm not really sure why I feel compelled to come here, but it's just the last place he was. Flowers are also laid at the official memorial that also honors the six lives lost in the 1985 Universal helicopter crash. Danny Breen comes here to remember his brother Pete, who died in the Cougar crash at age 55, the same age that Breen is now. A very kind older brother uh, took me to my first movie, took me to hockey games. Pete was a father of four. His children have since had their own, but Pete never got to become a grandfather. He also never got to see his little brother become mayor of St. John's. Yeah, he would have uh, kept to that. He uh, was the ultimate townie. He would have been so proud of, the, uh, of me becoming mayor. The pang of loss renewed on the anniversary of his death. I think time certainly diminishes the sting a bit, but it will always be there. For the families and for many others in this province, a part of history not to be forgotten. It is a remembrance of that event. It is a remembrance of how it affected everyone's lives and those lives that, are, that were lost. But it's also a time for everyone to come together and to continue the journey forward. There will also be a moment of silence here tonight. The length of 17 heartbeats, one heartbeat for each of these lost souls, meant to be a reminder that they all live on in the hearts of those who love them. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Carolyn Stokes for Here and Now. A kidnapping charge has been laid after a woman claimed she was held against her will on the weekend. The RCMP say a 44-year-old man from Happy Valley Goose Bay faces one charge of kidnapping and one charge of forcible confinement. The incident is alleged to have happened in the community on Saturday. Police say the woman later contacted them to say she escaped from a vehicle in Churchill Falls about four hours away. She was unharmed.
Marystown is getting ready to hold a public meeting on a plan to establish a massive salmon aquaculture operation in Placentia Bay. Grieg NL wants to farm Atlantic salmon in 11 sites like these ones on the south coast. The province is considering investing tens of millions of dollars to buy a stake in that project. Tomorrow's public meeting at 7 p.m. in Marystown is part of an environmental impact statement that Grieg has been ordered to prepare prior to approval. The coalition of groups concerned about aquaculture say the EIS process is being rushed because land-based aquaculture projects will soon make raising salmon in sea cages unnecessary. Uh, the projects in Maine and in Florida and in other locations now that are on land instead of being in the ocean, they're of a similar size. So that's where the world is going and the sand is shifting very quickly on this industry. You know, so I think that un underscores why there's some urgency on the part of government and Grieg, you know, to get this thing under, underway as quickly as possible. Well, there's bad news for this province's Capelin fishery. A survey from DFO shows there's been a drop of 70% in the population. But scientists say the decline can't be linked to overfishing. Instead, environmental changes are believed responsible. We don't have evidence that the removals from the commercial fishery are driving it. As, as I said, you can have an extremely low biomass and get a good cohort of capelin, and the opposite can happen, right? Um, it seems to be largely environmentally driven. Hmm. We'll see how many uh, we get uh, when the good weather comes this year. When the good comer, when the <laughs> when. good weather comes, uh, we've had snow, of course, many parts. Uh, and is there more snow to come? Is that what I heard? Well, the snow is uh, kind of tapering off through this evening uh, across the island, which is good. We have a bit of a break, and then it's a snow and rain mix coming later in the week for the mm -hmm. island. More snow for Labrador. Uh, let's deal with the situation right now because it was a bit of a slimy to slick drive home for folks across the Avalon, the northeast coast, uh, in into central parts of Newfoundland where the snow was coming down at a pretty good clip earlier this afternoon. We've tapered off to some freezing drizzle. Uh, temperatures near one, minus one right now at the airport. Winds sustained near 30 kilometers per hour. We're watching those heavier rounds of uh, snow. That's now pushing off to the south and the setup as we move forward through this evening as this low slowly there it is right there the center of that low pulls away it's just some lingering flurries and freezing drizzle across the menu uh, for tonight across the Avalon into central parts of Newfoundland really not much in the way of accumulation as we start the day tomorrow uh, we're going to be seeing a mix of sun and cloud across the board which is good but it's as we roll into the Tuesday night Wednesday time period that our next system that's it knocking on the door by the time we get to uh, Wednesday morning and then that will pull in with some snow. We'll talk about uh, amounts and uh, who's going to be changing over to rain and your complete forecast details coming up in just a few minutes, Debbie. Thanks, Ryan. Well, Brad Guzhu has done it again. He's won Canada's top men's curling prize. Team Canada beat Alberta last night 6-4 to four to win the briar. Guzhu had to draw to the button on his last rock in Regina. And that's what you dream about and uh, you know make it is even better especially after I only hit eight foot last year so this week was was so different than last year like I don't I don't ever want to say it was easy but the fact that we were playing so well we felt so confident and so in control the whole week and and we knew if we just kept doing that we'd give ourselves a chance and we did um, you know last year was such a grind that we had to claw tooth and nail to, to get it this year you know we were all firing on all cylinders and, and it's a completely different feeling so uh, these are definitely different uh, different feelings and different wins but uh, both are real special I bet they are <laughs> well Greg Smith skip of team Newfoundland and Labrador won the sportsmanship award and we'll be chatting with him tomorrow the St. John's Edge split a weekend series with the London Lightning. The two teams are battling for the top spot in the NBL's Central Division with London still sitting in first place. The Edge won on Saturday night but lost 124 to 102 yesterday in front of a sold out crowd at mile one. The team is heading out now uh, out of town for four road games but they'll be back in St. John's at the end of the month. Well, to South Korea now, where Canada's Paralympic hockey team is a perfect 3-0. and And St. John's own Liam Hickey is playing a big part in the team's success. 
And then Hickey's going to bring it back in again. Nicely on side. He might have a path to the net. He shoots and he scores. And there's the third goal that Canada's been hungry for. That's from today's game against Norway. Canada went on to win that game 8-0. Hickey had a goal and an assist. In Canada's two previous shutout games against Italy and Sweden, Hickey had four goals and three assists. The broadcasters are singing his praises. But Hickey, he's just, he's progressed so fast, and you've seen him in basketball. I, I watched him at the uh, Parapanic American Games in Toronto a few years ago. Comes in here. The skill, the skill level is off the charts. Hammers made so many quality stops this game, right under the sled. I love the muted celebration by Hickey, saying, you know what, this is just one step in the journey. <laughs> He's doing so well. He now, really Canada is. has the day off tomorrow, and they're still waiting to find out just who they're going to take on in the semifinals, which happened on Wednesday. So let's turn our attention now to competition closer to home. The Provincial Winter Games kicked off this weekend in Deer Lake, and our Colleen Connors was there. Um, what I'm looking forward to the most is enjoying this full experience because the last time I was a bit scared I was only 12 and this time I'm in my hometown so I just want to have a really good time. Uh, it's pretty exciting. It's my first time so I don't know what it's going gonna, it's gonna to be like but I'm really excited to do it. Lots of sports on the go. Today was the second full day of competition with young competitors taking over just about every single sports venue available on the West Coast. And here now is Colleen Connors was in the thick of it. She started her day at the bowling alley in Deer Lake. As you can see, I'm here at the bowling alley portion of the Newfoundland and Labrador Winter Games. I'm at the Hodder Memorial Complex in Deer Lake, and there is a lot of energy in this room right now. You've got players from all across the province lining up and bowling here all afternoon, right up until this evening. The energy is quite high in this room today with lots of fans cheering along. But just down the road at Xavier School, there's a little bit more of a quiet atmosphere. Precision is a word I would use to describe it. It is the gymnastics portion of the games. This school gym has transformed into a gymnastics playground. Teen gymnasts from across the province are here putting their best moves on the balance beam, uneven bars, and the floor routine. Well, we have a routine and it goes with music and we dance through it and then there's a variety of different tumbling skills. Yeah, very impressive. So how much practicing do you have to do to get that routine perfect? We train about 25 hours a week, um, so it's really time consuming and we do about an hour of each apparatus a day and then we do um, conditioning. And those hundreds or possibly thousands of hours of practice have paid off. Both gymnasts are pleased with their performance. Well, I feel really good about my first tumbling line and my leaps were pretty good. How do you feel? Well, yeah, I feel the same. Like my leaps are better and my tumbling lines were okay. Chelsea scored a 9.4 and Paige a 9.5 in their floor routines, all while a large crowd looked on. This is their first experience at the Winter Games, but certainly appears this won't be their last display of a strong competition. Back here at the bowling alley, things are getting more and more intense as the day goes on. These athletes will compete until about 5.30 this evening, and then tomorrow morning marks the playoffs in the bowling portion of the Newfoundland and Labrador Winter Games. Now, athletes will continue to pile into this area of the province and compete in a slew of different sports right up until the end of the week. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Deer Lake. What a great experience for all those young yeah. athletes. And of course, uh, we'll be hearing more from the Winter Games uh, as the week yeah. goes on. So nerve wracking to see them on the balance I beam. I oh, don't even want to watch. <laughs> is much messier than what they show on the outside. Will this online program make it faster to get counseling?
Welcome back to Here and Now. The provincial government is introducing a mental health program that could reduce wait times for counseling. Right now, some people wait up to two years before they get help through the public health system. The hope is that the new program will make a difference. Ramona Deering has this report. Peter Cornish logs his anxiety levels using a program that's been available to students at Memorial University for a couple of years. Right now, I'd say it's actually not too bad. It's a, it's a two, it's pretty low. He's the director of the Student Wellness and Counseling Center there, but he's used the program himself. And now the provincial government is introducing it in 15 clinics around the province. Cornish has high hopes based on how it's worked for some students. And you're getting better outcomes by spending less time with an expert. One of those experts is Eastern Health psychologist Sarah Pegram, who walked us through the Therapist Assisted Online Program, or TAO for short. These are things that they can access. It's online therapy. Not everyone will be encouraged to try it, but Pegram says it can be great for people who have anxiety, depression, or an addiction. Feelings of, I'm feeling anxious. However, not as effective for people with PTSD or obsessive compulsive disorder. The online sessions can be done whenever it's convenient. After completing this session, you will have learned that everyone has a constant stream of thoughts running through their heads and know that with people, what goes on on the inside is much messier than what they show on the outside. Videos, interactive exercises. Start by taking a deep, full, slow breath. Mindfulness techniques and a feedback system that counselors can track to see how their clients are doing. Anyone who seems to be in crisis will get numbers to call. Plus, counselors will still interact with their clients, either on the phone or through Skype. So I, I still get to check in with a, a real live human being once a week. Absolutely, you'd be able to check in with a real live human once a week and be able to ask questions and if you're encountering any challenges with some of the material covered, you'd, I'd be able to help you out with that and troubleshoot some of that stuff. But for around 15 minutes instead of the traditional 50 minutes. And that's where the new program could take some pressure off the mental health system. Public health wait lists for counselling can be as long as two years. So the difference that this online therapy could make is that a person could get access to some information and resources sooner. So they'll be able to do things online in their own time, you know, as opposed to not getting anything. I was wondering if there are any openings for some online clients. The government has watched the success of the program at Memorial University, and now the province is the first in Canada to adopt the online therapy. I think we're leading uh, the country with uh, um, innovation. And maybe shorter wait times to see counsellors within the public health system. Ramona Deering, CBC News, St. John's. And to get more information about the online therapy, just call 811. And by the way, uh, community mental health clinics are opening their doors to uh, walk-in sessions, and you don't have to have a prior appointment for that. It's called the Doorways Program, and again, as Debbie mentioned, just call 811 for more info. We can't go there. CUPE's side of what's holding up the negotiations.
Welcome back once again. And before we get to the uh, weather, we want to uh, show some video at uh, what was seen running down the highway on the southern shore. This was taken yesterday. Gorgeous, beautiful yes. little Newfoundland ponies trying to find their freedom. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have to run far, though. They're Newfoundland ponies. Yeah, no, they were seen running loose in Whitless Bay over the weekend, uh, but Peg Ryan says they have since been safely returned to their owners. I didn't know we could get Palomino Newfoundland ponies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Beautiful animals. They, look in good they shape certainly too. are. They seem, they seem robust. And we say a lot only in Newfoundland, but there you go, <laughs> right? Uh, it was, uh, again, a bit of a mixed bag this weekend. Certainly uh, some snow, uh, more snow for some than others. Uh, today, the snow continued, but it started to taper off to some flurries and freezing drizzle. That's really all we have to contend with this evening if you are heading out. Minus one in St. John's and Bonavista. Near the freezing mark, even plus two along the west coast right now. More of the same tomorrow as the northerly flow continues, but does ease off and uh, not quite the strong uh, almost sustained near 60 in Bonavista right now uh, St. John's and Gander in that 30 kilometer per hour range uh, right now that'll generally be where we are again tomorrow uh, but uh, just not qu quite the stronger gust that we've been seeing at times today there's that snow again coming to an end today what we see in these types of setups is if the snow is heavy enough it actually pulls down the colder air allows it to continue as snow when that heavier snow moves off to the south well Again, not quite cold enough to see that snow. That's why we have that uh, freezing drizzle mixing in there. Uh, not quite the snow making temperatures we need all the way from aloft down to the surface. And so there goes that low. And we have a pretty solid Tuesday shaping up as we have this nice break in between. But boy, the uh, folks in the northeast parts of the U.S. bracing for storm number three over the last week. And this is going to be another big one over a foot of snow for places up towards the northeast parts of the U.S., uh, especially up towards the Maine region uh, and, uh, and, of course, New England. So we'll be uh, watching them grumble as that one moves in. And it will be moving into our neck of the woods as well in a bit of a one-two punch. And here are the special weather statements which are already in effect, mainly for wind and snow combination as we roll into the Wednesday morning time period. It's gonna be quite blustery here. We will see a wreck house gusts to 100 kilometers per hour by tomorrow evening and up to 140 by the time we get to the Wednesday morning time period. Here's how it all plays out again. Very quiet to start through the day tomorrow. Temperatures in the minus one to minus two range. Northeasterly winds will start in the minus six to minus 10 range for inland areas of Labrador and anywhere from minus four in the Straits to minus 12 in through Nain. Timeline tomorrow. Some sun breaking through for most of us, a solid mix of sun and cloud. Again, wind sustained in that 20 to 30 kilometer per hour range. That'll allow temperatures to rise to as warm as three and four degrees along the south coast tomorrow. Looking like a very nice day along the Buren Peninsula, Mr. Germain. I served that up just for you, who he is, of course, heading down there for tomorrow. Uh, winds again picking up on the uh, west coast of the island for tomorrow as that system starts to approach. And there again are temperatures right near the freezing mark in Labrador, so not too bad at all. Now, as we take a look at your timeline through Tuesday night into Wednesday, Watch the snow that's going to be rolling in, and it will really start to accumulate on Wednesday morning, uh, basically from St. John's right across to Cornerbrook. As we roll into the afternoon, probably a little bit earlier than what this forecast model is showing, snow will mix over to some showers and drizzle, especially Wednesday afternoon into the evening, all the way up into central parts of Newfoundland and Cornerbrook. The snow will then start to roll in to Labrador. So temperatures rising to two and three degrees as that snow mixes over to rain. We are talking about increasing clouds and some late day snow pushing into Labrador. Generally five to 10 centimeters over the south and east, but could see some pockets approaching 15 centimeters, especially in some of those higher elevation areas. Also the east side of the Northern Peninsula up through the Straits by Thursday morning. This system really just getting ramped up in Labrador by then. We'll talk about Thursday situation, rain and Quite a bit of it for parts of the island for Thursday. More snow in Labrador. Those details are still to come. Anthony. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you for the personalized weather forecast as well. I'll be going to Marystown tomorrow, so tune in to here now. We'll be covering that uh, public forum that Greg NL is having in Marystown tomorrow evening. In other news, QP is taking out full-page newspaper ads telling the government to stop playing games and to get back to the bargaining table. Like NAEP, QP has agreed to a one-time only no layoff clause, but talks are at an impasse because of a letter the government wants included in the new collective agreement. I met up with QP National Rep 
Brian Farewell to find out why negotiations have gone off the rails. Well, if you've paid attention to advertising, you know that QP and the government seem to be at some kind of impasse and try to figure out what's going on. Uh, so, Brian, where do things stand? What's, what's going on right now? We are at an impasse, as opposed to a pause that the, uh, that the Minister of, of, uh, of Labour, or excuse me, Minister of Finance referenced last week. Uh, we have a situation where the language they proposed, mm -hmm. as a sidebar letter actually, is actually holding up us reaching a collective agreement. We are at tier two bargaining with the government, uh, going through the, the, the more controversial issues, and we will, we will wade our way through those, and we have some local issues. But right now, we can't get past a sidebar uh, letter that they're requiring and actually demanding, and we, we just, we can't go there. All right, so just to be clear now, there was a lot of stories in the news about NAEP and this, this no layoff clause. Mm. You have agreed to something similar to what NAEP? Yes, exactly. The, the no layoff clause is a one paragraph statement, quite controversial as it unfolded, of course. You remember the Board of Trade yep. and the, Labor, excuse me, the Employers Council. Uh, even Mr. Uh, Osborne uh, made reference to the bonding agency requiring mm. some kind of comfort letter so that, uh, so that he could justify or, I, I guess, get back to him and confirm right. that, that this, this is a one-off. This is a one-off and yep. will terminate on uh, March 31st, 2000. Right. Uh, excuse me, 2020. So we, when, we, when we were asked for that at the table, we were reluctant. We went away. We came back and we actually gave them definite language that was, and I'll just re reference, I'll read it exactly so you can, yep. here's what we proposed. For clarification purposes, with respect to the MOU layoff, the parties agree that this document will not roll over into a subsequent collective agreement unless the parties agree in writing. It's definite. Right. The, it's clear. The, the original language already said for yep. the duration, this rubber stamps it, it's over. Okay, March so what's the problem? They actually made a statement when I presented that proposal at the table that mm -hmm. that seems to uh, that seems to clarify any concerns I, I, I would I, I would have had and we thought we were ready to move on the next day the minister with his staff came back in and presented this which was the original proposal for clarification purposes the parties agree that any provision in the collective agreements including ancillary documents so which, everything which is LOUs and MOUs, right. right, such as this one, mm -hmm. do not automatically roll over into subsequent collective agreements unless the parties agree in writing. So that would mean that nothing carries over. That means that, see, current agreement is really a default position in bargaining. We go in with proposals, the employer goes in with proposals. Right. We don't agree, we say current agreement. So the worst case scenario here is that in, when this contract is up, we can go into the bargaining table and the employer can actually tell us that they don't agree with any of them rolling over, so we actually have to construct a new collective right, agreement. Right, so you start from scratch. We start from scratch. All right, so that's why you guys aren't talking anymore. That is that is not on for us. We cannot go there. It jeopardizes our collective agreement, and we say to them, look, you wanted a, a, a comfort zone on a layoff, we'll, we'll give it to you. We did give it to you. If there's any other letter you have an issue with, we'll look at that open-mindedly, right. and we'll, conf we'll try to deal with that, but so, not this. So why was Mr. Osborne able to get an agreement with NAEP, but uh, you guys are at this impasse with CUPE? All I can tell you is that the language that proposed it to, to the other, that we noticed, and the language that they gave us is the same language. We have this sidebar letter that we can't go. Whether or not another bargaining agent sign that form is incidental to us. We can't go there. All right. Whether there was, I suggest you ask the minister. Okay. Mr. Farewell, thank you very much. Thank you very Appreciate much, that. Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. Now, on that note, we're soon going to know the province's spending plans for the next 12 months. The government has confirmed that the 2018 budget will be delivered in the House of Assembly on March the 27th. Back in November, the province's fiscal update predicted a deficit of upwards of $850 million. It's the highest award the City of St. John's can bestow on a citizen or an organization. And only one woman has received the Freedom of the City Award, Eleanor Gill Radcliffe. But that's all about to change. Just ahead, a chat with the formidable Shani Duff.
Welcome back once again to Here and Now. A film shot in this province snagged a lot of trophies at last night's Canadian Screen Awards in Toronto. Maudie, which tells the story of folk artist Maud Lewis from Nova Scotia, won seven Screen Awards. It was named Best Picture, Sally Hawkins won for Lead Actor, Ethan Hawke won for Best Supporting Actor, and Stephenville's Sherry White was recognized for her writing. And on top of all that, there were also awards for directing, editing, and costume design. Well done. Well, she has been a trailblazer for the capital city, and now St. John's City Council is honoring Shani Duff with the Freedom of the City Award for her political, professional, and community efforts, the highest award given by the city. Shani Duff won eight municipal elections, including mayor. She's been a community advocate for many causes with groups like the Heritage Foundation and the Newfoundland Historic Trust. She was appointed to the Order of Newfoundland and Labrador and the Order of Canada and has an honorary doctorate from Memorial. The Freedom of the City Award is the latest accolade for Duff. Well, Shani Duff, congratulations. How does it feel to be honored in this way? It feels absolutely wonderful because the city is a very special place to me and although I've, I've been well acknowledged for some of the things that I've done, I think it is particularly special to have people who are your peers in a place that you spent most of your working life say this. You have the freedom of the city. Doesn't give me freedom from taxes, by the way. <laughs> oh, too bad. <laughs> yeah, too bad. <laughs> well, you talk about how significant this place mm -hmm. has been oh, to yeah. you over the years. These days, there are a lot of female faces sitting around here, uh, and younger women yes. as well. What do you think when you reflect on this change? I think it's fabulous. I've spent many hours speaking to young women and mentoring them over the age, and, and speaking at events, talking about the importance of women being in seats where decisions are made. And I'm very pleased with this group that we have here. I know them all, and I think it's absolutely wonderful. This is a record number of women for City Hall. Now, we acknowledged women last week, International Women's Day. There is the Me Too campaign underway, other campaigns that uh, show that women are not going to take what they have over the years. You, for instance, right here in this chamber, oh, yes. you took a lot of verbal and mental abuse that went along with that, particularly from former Mayor Andy Wells. Um, what do you think now as you reflect back on those days and why didn't you quit? Well, I didn't quit because I thought it was important what I was doing and I, I would never back down from bullying. I just, I just dislike it intensely and I felt that if you back down and sneak away, that's not going to change anything. So I, I just stood my ground and outed it in the public chamber. And at that point when I did that, I got 3,000 emails from all over the place, not only Newfoundland, saying thank you. Because I think a lot of women have felt that they haven't been heard and it, it does no good to cow down to it. You have to stand up to it. Mm -hmm. Sands are shifting, aren't they? Oh my, yes. I mean, it's, and I'm delighted to see that. And I think women have gotten a lot more strength and confidence. It was oftentimes a lack of confidence that women had that prevented them from, you know, moving forward in their careers. And it isn't without its challenges. I, I'm, I'm very conscious of the, I would say, work home balances that women who are working and who are making it to decision-making places have to face. So I think there are still changes that have to happen, but I don't think we're ever going to really go backwards to the way things were before. And just on a final point, uh, Shani Duff, you have been extremely busy over the years, involved in so many different groups. And even today, you're still busy as a volunteer. Well, very busy. Frank asks me sometimes if I'm really retired, <laughs> <laughs> even today. And uh, it, because I, I, I see things that need to be done and I get a huge satisfaction out of being part of doing them or making changes. So I doubt if I, while, while I can still stand and talk, I will ever not be involved in things. Shani Duff, thank you very much and uh, congratulations once again. Well, thank you and I want to thank the city for this incredible honor, which I must say is really something I'm really pleased about it.
That's wonderful. Yeah, huh? rightly and proud. Yeah. She is known for her heritage work, as I mentioned in the uh, set, set up to the interview, but there are other causes near and dear to her heart. Mm -hmm. There's Habitat for Humanity, the Bannerman Park Revitalization, right. the Grand Concourse, and much more. Right. So Debbie Council gave uh, approved it today, but when does she actually get her hands on it? Uh, <laughs> sometime this summer, to okay. be announced. How many unused pills can be collected in one day? The people behind an annual pill drop give us that staggering total next. Time to meet our Young Athlete of the Day. This is Claire McDonald from St. John's. Claire is eight years old and lives with cerebral palsy, epilepsy, and autism. And although she has uh, some challenges, she doesn't let that stop her from participating in her favorite sports programs. This is Claire's third year taking part in sledge hockey, and she also loves playing challenger baseball, wheelchair basketball, as well as swimming. Wow, very busy. Way to go, Claire. You're today's Young Athlete of the Day. The weather update is brought to you by Belltone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. So uh, last week uh, on Friday, I asked, De uh, sorry, Carolyn and I'm Anthony. Anthony. This right, is Debbie. Right. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, daylight savings, thumbs up or thumbs down? What's your vote? Huh? Is it worth the hour? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought so. Some people I kind of heard grumbling, yeah. so I threw it out on social media, both Facebook and Twitter. Okay. Uh, lots of respondents, uh, and, and in <laughs> fact, uh, 1.6, so that's 1,600 folks uh, that voted on uh, Facebook, and you can see an overwhelming number said, love the later evenings, yeah. Yeah. well worth the lost hour this weekend. I actually uh, did the same <laughs> poll on Twitter. And it, about a thousand people voted there. Same thing, about eighty percent versus twenty percent. Yeah. So I want to know you got that camera in my house. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's you bashing the alarm. That's, that's right. you when you were on the morning <laughs> show. Yeah, that's, that's true. right. Uh, interesting. A couple of interesting points just before we move on. Uh, some folks saying, why not? You know, put in daylight savings and just keep it. Well. 
And again, the 9 a.m. sunrises in December would probably dissuade some people. True. Probably the best <laughs> suggestion <laughs> that I heard. Yeah, exactly. Uh, from Justin Boudreau at the Gander Weather Office said, why not? We're half hour ahead. Why not make it an hour ahead and stick there? So then you're only, you know, is it? You're going into very dangerous territory <laughs> messing with that. Just throwing half it out hour. there. I kind of <laughs> like it. The half hour, go an extra half hour and keep it there. Eh, I kind of mm. like it. Let have it, to have, simmer. A, have to have another poll <laughs> for yeah, another day. That's right. Uh, okay, so special weather statements in effect as we uh, segue to the weather. And you can see where we have uh, special weather statements from the Buren right up to the northern peninsula. Wreckhouse is under a wind warning as well, where the winds are going to really start ramping up by the time we get to Tuesday evening. Uh, by Wednesday morning, in fact, gusts will be in that 140 kilometer per hour range. This is the low that is going to be causing all of the unsettled weather over the next couple days. And it's going to be a bit of a one two punch, and we'll show you what we mean in just a second. Uh, there is the first low that has been snowing itself out over the, through today, uh, kind of redeveloped uh, on that trough from our original weekend system. And watch your timeline here as we roll into Tuesday morning, area of high pressure in firm control. Things looking pretty good. We'll see some sunshine for most of us tomorrow. The clouds building in. Uh, forecast models a little bit later over the last uh, couple of runs with the snow moving in as we roll through the Wednesday morning time period. Late, late overnight Tuesday into Wednesday morning into the afternoon starting to mix with some drizzle and freezing drizzle for the Avalon and the Buren peninsulas and then eventually over to some drizzle and some shower activity for the Buren and the Avalon then eventually into central Newfoundland and even western Newfoundland by Wednesday evening and this is when that snow is starting to build into southern Labrador by Thursday morning. We're not looking at much in the way of accumulation but the snow's just beginning in Labrador by Thursday morning. Uh, two to five centimeters central and west could see five to ten Pockets of 15 possible, especially over the southwest and uh, possibly over the southeast parts of the Avalon. We'll keep you posted on that. Here is the uh, setup as we roll throughout the day on Thursday. Periods of rain at times steady moving in for central and eastern Newfoundland. A big push of southeasterly winds here. Temperatures on the rise. The snow will really start to ramp up through the day on Thursday. Periods of snow come down at a pretty good clip. This low will then roll up into the uh, uh, Labrador region or just south of and we'll continue to see some light accumulation even through Friday tapering to some flurries on Saturday for Saturday going to keep a pretty close eye on this system which uh, looks to move to our east but I'll uh, be keeping an eye on that for the Avalon wouldn't take much of a shift back west to bring some snow but uh, other than that just looking at some flurry chances as we roll through this weekend so of course lots of travel dis dis disruption last weekend excuse me not so much this weekend as just some flurry chances but again keeping an eye on that uh, what looks to be just offshore system as we roll into the Saturday time period. So yeah, big temperature push in the first one in quite a while for Newfoundland as we see plus side temps up towards four or five degrees with some rain and then tapering back down to, towards the freezing mark for the weekend in Labrador. Finally, some snow on your menu. It's been a while, but Thursday into Friday, definitely looking at some solid accumulation, especially through central and towards the coast. And we'll keep you posted on that in the coming days. Debbie. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks to the School of Pharmacy, more than 30,000 pills have been removed from homes to be destroyed. In conjunction with Royal Newfoundland Constabulary, pharmacy students held a pill drop on Sunday to let people drop off unwanted and unused prescription and non-prescription pills. Here now's Jeremy Eden was also there to chat about the event. So we don't want medication to go in the garbage for a couple reasons. One is other people can actually access them from the dump. Animals can accidentally eat them and they would be exposed and that could be harmful to them. Some people even flush them down the toilet or wash them down the sink and that goes into the environment as well. So by bringing them here, we can take them and we incinerate them so they're safely disposed and no one has to worry about them being harmful to the environment or the wrong people getting their hands on medications. We are seeing everything from vitamins, um, over-the-counter pain medications. We're seeing prescription medications for lowering your blood pressure or cholesterol. Um, we're also seeing a lot of the more potent painkillers, uh, such as you know morphine, codeine, that you would receive as a prescription, and you might not use the whole prescription of. As everyone is aware of now in, in all over the world, there's a really large uh, problem with overprescribing of opioids, um, as well as 
overuse. So anytime we're seeing people realize that they don't need the medication um, and they don't need to have it in their house, and just, just in case, uh, we like to see it being returned. At our drop-off table, we have a bunch of brochures that patients can take home. Um, they're everything from prescription medication abuse to questions that you should ask your prescriber, your physician, your pharmacist, uh, nurse practitioner, practitioner, anyone that you're getting medications from. They're questions that you should ask to make sure that you should be taking that medication. And if you don't need it, then you shouldn't be taking it. Well, now to a story that will certainly resonate with drivers in this province. He is nicknamed Professor Pavement, and he's the inventor of a revolutionary way to roll asphalt that could actually eliminate potholes forever. Now, after more than 30 years of trying, his concept is finally getting a little traction. Stu Mills has the story. Back in 1987, Professor El Halim was hard at work ironing out his ideas on how to eradicate potholes. Imagine this steel cylinder as a work crew rolling fresh asphalt on the road. Where the cylinder depresses the pavement, cracks form. Halim's breakthrough idea was to spread out the load between two cylinders wrapped in rubber. I believe it is the beginning of the end of potholes. Let me put it this way. But eradicating potholes wouldn't be so easy. 20 years later, CBC caught up with Professor Pavement again. The National Research Council had helped to build a prototype called a mirror, named after his son, but then his plans hit a bump in the road. Paving companies weren't lining up to build a machine that might put them out of business. I would say frustrated. I was disappointed. Halim isn't disappointed today. The Ministry of Transportation started listening seriously to his ideas about how to make crack-free asphalt and save taxpayers money. Then, the local construction giant Tomlinson became very interested. Their engineers built a working Amir complete with rubber tracks. Last fall, Amir and several traditional rollers went head-to-head -head on this road in Canada. A traditional roller did the left lane, Amir's rubber tracks did the right, proving Halim's invention is the runaway winner. Tomlinson has already poured a half million dollars of its own money into an easy-to-use Amir roller. Steer left and right. The belts basically, they do not create cracking. Uh, if you were to drive this over sand or over a, a sheet of styrofoam, it would simply compact it. It would not crack it. The company's building a second roller. The real test will be how the road stands up to freeze and thaw cycles and lots of water. In June, Tomlinson will take the rollers to a big paving job where the Ministry of Transportation contract calls for a seven-year guarantee. For Halim, who's now preparing to retire from Carleton, the promise of commercial success has been worth the wait. A true researcher always dream of serving the public. If you are afraid of some new ideas due to ignorance, it's very difficult to succeed. And for frustrated drivers, success likely can't come quickly enough. Stu Mills, CBC News, Ottawa. All right, our viewer picture of the day. Wow. This is a really nice one. Wow. Stairway to the stars. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, NASA? <laughs> <laughs> this one uh, was taken on the island, uh, mm -hmm. northeast coast. And if you know where uh, Ochre Hill is, Ochre Hill. then you'll probably get this location. There's an Ochre Pit Cove. But I don't know if the two are close to each They're other. They're not. <laughs> no, got to go further west. Okay. Hmm.
welcome back. Well, time flies when you're having fun. That's likely what the folks behind Come From Away are saying. It's hard to believe, but it is one year now, the one year anniversary of the show premiering on Broadway. It's been a year. Fantastic. And to celebrate, they have made a video. People from around the world singing one of the show's most popular tunes. On the northeast tip of North America, on an island called Newfoundland, there's an airport. It used to be one of the biggest airports in the world. And next to it is a town called Gary. Welcome to the rock if you come from away. Especially when one comes from one like Newfoundland. Welcome to the rock. It looks like it's off a pretty good time. Yeah, uh, that's right. fantastic. Yeah. And I'm so glad that the show's being recognized as we've talked it's done about so some well. Of, and yeah. it was so tastefully done, it could have yeah. gone so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it was but really it's nice. fabulous. Yeah, it's great. So how do you celebrate a milestone birthday? Well, it doesn't hurt to share it with friends, of course. Don't don't feel old. And I feel well, thank God. I have my health. That's what led this Montreal retirement home to throw a collective birthday bash for nine special residents. They're each turning 100 years of age this year, wow. and the community is now home to 20 centenarians, some as old as 105. Residents received letters of congratulations from the Prime Minister, Montreal's mayor, and even the Queen. Now that's a gift for all ages. Mm -hmm. Look at them. It's amazing, huh? I wonder what their secret well is. Well done. Definitely. A lot of uh, tips in that uh, <laughs> circle there uh, for, uh, of course, uh, aging very well. Now, uh, our viewer picture of the day, uh, Anthony cheated. He had some... I didn't. He called a friend. <laughs> <laughs> it was that or the 50-50. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and so the answer was Terra Nova National Park. And there's a reason we're showing this picture. It's because Terra Nova National Park has just been awarded... The, a dark sky preserve, which is an area in which no artificial lighting is visible and active measures are now in place to educate and promote the reduction of light pollution to public and nearby municipalities. Well, my first guess when we knew where it was, was maybe it's a fire, forest fire spotting uh, tower, but now maybe it's astronomers it's or observe. people can get up there and, and have that just natural night sky. Works for the bear counters. Ray is gonna have to send <laughs> Ray's gonna have to send us the info, but thanks for sending the picture. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and that is our program. Thank you for being here. Have a great night. See you tomorrow. Good night, everyone.